Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, my name is Jim Groom. I work at Reclaim Hosting. And I just, before I get started, we'll get into the presentation. I just want to say, I, I think yesterday was one of the best conference days I've ever had. And shaping today, shaping up to be equally as amazing. How many, was anyone in the karaoke bar at Fox's? <laughs> right? I have to say, at about 11 o'clock, this is my conference experience, and we'll get into the presentation. About 11 o'clock at night, it's kind of regular, like, you know, 40, 30, 50 year old, like me hanging out. And then, like, 30 or 40, 20 year olds come in to the main place, and they are there to party. And, like, in the best possible sense of that term, they are cool, they are digging it. And then I have to wait an hour to do my karaoke song. I go before Tom Ferrelli, who does. Um, dirty, no, he doesn't do dirty, he does Highway to Hell. <laughs> Kills it, and the kids are like, yeah! <laughs> so I go up after that doing the Pixies. I'm like, no one knows the Pixies. No one has any idea. And the whole crowd is in it. And then, like a 21 year old comes up and does Rocky Show Horror Time Warp. <laughs> and the whole place just blew up. It was like a bomb. So, like, that's. Oh, we are 23 for me right now. So that's what I am. <laughs> so you know. That's how I feel. So if this gets a little crazy, not my fault. I blame Inverness. I blame you. <laughs> Great. So anyway, welcome. Um, I, my presentation is really kind of a, an attempt to understand some things that have been transitioning for over a decade. But I think that transition is starting to materialize with different applications in Web3 that are not just cryptocurrencies, right? But are actually maybe social networks like Mastodon and others. So that's where I'm going. That's kind of like the 10 minute, or I mean the 10 second version of my talk. You got it, you can leave. Fine, <laughs> go see something good. But this is the longer self-indulgent version because I'm always self-indulgent in all my presentations. Okay, <laughs> they walk into a bar. You look hotter online, right? This is from a course I taught at Mary Washington, which I'll return to in this presentation because as um, everyone knows, I always talk about the S106. I've been living off of that for 12, 13 years. Maybe not everyone, I have to explain what it is, but who's saying this to whom? <laughs> That's my question, because I assumed, you know, in my pre-fem ed tech days that it was Superman. And then the woman who made this is like, no, it's actually Wonder Woman talking to Superman. This is an assignment that a student did for a course we taught called DS-106 that I think has a lot in common with some of the things that Dave was talking about this morning in his keynote. This idea of building and creating a community based on thinking through elements of recentering the relationship of power and understanding how we create and where we create and how we think. But I'll get into that in a bit, because this is not going to be an educational or pedagogical talk as much as it might be a little bit of a thinking of the technology. So Web 2.0, and I know few people in this room came up with it like me, um, was always referred to as the social web, right? Web 3 has been described as the crypto web, and I think some of the things, and John Udell says this in particular, is I'd much rather normalize the term around the federated web. Thinking about what Web3 means in terms of federation. I'll talk about that specifically in a second. I can't get these things figured out. <laughs> this is me circa 2007, 2008. I was fully in to Web 2.0, as you can see. I drank the Kool-Aid, I wore the hat. I was, someone said this recently and they cringed when they said it, I was what they called the evangelist, right? With all the difficult religious overtones. In fact, my nickname was the preacher. I believed in it. And I believed in the idea that Web 2.0 was in some way revolutionary, right? Now, what I believed and what's true may be difficult and problematic, and we can talk about that. But one of the things that came out early on was this idea of 
what is Web 2.0? And Web 2.0 was in many ways a marketing term created by O'Reilly to, to, to define and understand something new, right? How the web had been shifting from the mid to late 90s to this new kind of definition of what the web was in 2001, 2002, all the way up through, I don't know, 2010, 2011. But all of these points a very interesting kind of Akamai. Does anyone remember Akamai? Mm -hmm. Right? That's what we used to use to share files before peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent came along. Or Napster. Or syndication for blogs is something I want to talk about in a second. But I'm interested in this idea of part of what Web 2.0 was framed as very early on was peer-to-peer -peer networking. Was the idea that we were getting away from centralized networks. What do you think about when you think about Web 2.0? Now it's probably very different. And that's part of my talk. This is a famous Web 2.0 meme map. And this came out as part of a whole O'Reilly, this is what Web 2.0 is. And you can go find this online. You can search Web 2.0 O'Reilly, and you'll get a, a very interesting paper about Web 2.0 and what it is and how it works. One of the things I was super interested in is BitTorrent, right? This point, radical decentralization, right? Sound familiar, <laughs> right? Blogs, participation, not publishing, right? That's OER might want to think about that a little bit. And so there's also this idea of tagging, not taxonomy, there's some interesting kind of frames here. Wikipedia, which I think in some ways, the governance model was always difficult, but in some ways was one of the more consistent elements of Web 2.0 into Web 3 that was like, well, we've always been doing the peer-to-peer -peer open editing. Nothing really changed for us. So as probably with most of my presentations, I cheated. <laughs> and I cheated in a good way, though. I went online and I wrote a blog post because I've been doing that for 20 almost years. I have 3,752 blog posts. And in another year and a half, I will hit 4,000 blog posts, which will be 200 blog posts every year for 20 years. So I'm old. And that's a lot of bad writing. Like a lot. It's a lot of its crap. Most of it. But there's a couple of gems if you write that much you might find this presentation is one of them and <laughs> this blog post is kind of thinking through what um you know i wanted to talk about not only coming back to oer 23 but talking about with these two kind of clashing ideas of web 2 and web 3. you can see um john udell gives me a kind of kudos around, hey, Web 2.0, the social web versus the federated versus the crypto. I stole that already, but I'll steal more from him. It's coming. Do, does anyone or does everyone in this room know who John Udell is? Do we have? So John Udell, an interesting cat. In 1999, he wrote this book, one of those O'Reilly books. This one has the sea lions. And this book is called Internet Groupware. And does anyone know what internet groupware is? Like, any idea? Internet groupware was basically in 99, the idea of what social networks would become five or six years before Facebook became a thing. He was theorizing through open standards what open or what social networks would be five or six years early. So in some ways, this is kind of like ground zero for the publishing thinking around Web 2.0, right? This guy is now responding to me on Mastodon, telling me how I should do this talk. <laughs> this is the guy who wrote the book on Web 2.0. Like you're getting high end material here. <laughs> Blogs, participation, not publishing. This is one of the points that came up. I'm super interested in the idea of when we think about Web 2.0 right now, you often think of Facebook, right? Twitter, Instagram. And it's interesting because social web, web 2.0 in 2005, 2006, when I started blogging, was not that, right? You only could get on to Facebook with a .edu email. It was super exclusive. You couldn't get in. YouTube didn't exist, just started. 
right? There was no, Flickr was probably, Flickr and Delicious were probably the two social networks that you would know still. The thing that kept the blogosphere together was this open protocol called RSS. And what RSS very simply did is it took an XML file of all of your posts or of any given post that came out new and it let people know through a feed reader, this is a new post and it came from here. And that was the loose federation of early web 2.0. The blogosphere, people still blog. You hear Alan Levine say that every so often. <laughs> um, and that brings me back to this discussion I'm having on Mastodon, very interestingly. We'll talk about that, about web 2.0. And he says here, of course, the RSS connected blog network, this is John Udell, the guy who wrote the social network book, connected a uh, blog network was beautifully federated and still provides a model for doing things that way right like web 2.0 wasn't one thing it wasn't twitter it wasn't facebook certainly not instagram right it was an idea of a decentralized open protocol driven web that people could manage and control hopefully on their own how many of you know of this technology called the trackback? You do. Can I put you on this? No, I'm not going to put you on this. Because <laughs> I don't. No, I'm kidding. So the trackback is this kind of other technology that um, O'Reilly talks about in Web 2.0 um, in the kind of 2004. Talks about this idea of trackback was brought to you by a permalink. Does everyone know what a permalink is? Okay, permalink is basically this. So here is mine. Oh, we are. Maybe someone will see themselves in the crowd in my blog post. It's amazing. <laughs> the blog post is amazing. That's my URL, babatuesdays.com. And this is not an empty plug like Martin Weld does for his books. I don't want <laughs> to go here. And then that's the slash. And then this is a permalink. Oh, I could touch the screen. That's weird. Um, <laughs> and that permalink takes that post off of my main web page and makes it its own page. That allows you to comment on that post specifically, but it also allows you to take that beautiful URL, put it in your blog, and link to me. And what will happen when you do that, like magic, is I will get a notification that this person is linking back to me. This person is tracking back. They're talking to me or about me. Sometimes that's good. Oftentimes it's not. You don't have to publish every permanent track back if you don't want to. But that was the way in which we federated the blogosphere. That was the way in which we talked to each other through these weird things called the blogs that weren't just about cats or politics. Well, well yeah. <laughs> the early blogosphere was in many ways a federated web. Oh. I told you I couldn't avoid it. <laughs> DS106, I mean, I am biased. This was a course taught at the University of Mary Washington in 2010, and then turned into an open online course in 2011, designed by people like Martha Burtis, Alan Levine, Tom Woodward, and myself. And the idea behind it was to take this magic called RSS and give every student their own site and through the magic of RSS and through the magic of tags and through the magic of syndication, every piece of work they did in their own space would syndicate what we called the mother blog. So you could see everything in one place, but the students still own their own work in their own space called their blog. Revolutionary, right? Syndication, actually federation. This little piece is Martha Burtis is doing, it's magic. Each of these links out to an assignment. The assignments were created by the students. Not only did they do the assignments, but they submitted the assignments. So this is an assignment I wanna do. Here's my submission. Now you'll see, you could vote on them, but the other cool thing, and I'll look at this one here, you not only have the assignment, but through RSS and tags, every person in the course who did that assignment that someone else proposed, you can see it. So there's a long list of other people who did this assignment, so you can go and get inspiration, all federation. Here, on the other side, is a tag where people would share the tutorials they did to create that assignment. This is a page with a permalink 
using syndication to create an open educational resource that's federated. DS-106. Boy, life! Okay, <laughs> now, but Web 2.0 became increasingly centralized. We know this, right? We're dealing with this right now. There was a $40 billion deal. I don't want to get too deep into it. I only made a few million off of it, but <laughs> Web 2.0 became increasingly centralized, and I had the, the joy to actually meet face-to-face -face with John Udell in the Muir Woods in San Francisco in February, and it was awesome, and he's awesome because he's like one of the early Web 2.0 pioneers, and he made no money off of it. He's the one who did the hypothesis LTI integration that Kate talked about yesterday. I mean, this guy is awesome. He is my mentor. He's my hero. And he said this, Twitter has devolved into brands talking to brands. How much, how true is that? That's where we've become. And this idea of Web3 being the federated web versus the crypto web is interesting to me. Here's the foundations I found on the Web3 foundation definition. Users own their own data, not corporations. Does that sound familiar, Lauren, to you at all? Users owning their own data? Yeah. I mean, that's what Reclaim has been trying to frame through our work at UMW and then as a company for 15 years. And then there's a really awesome movement in Europe. It started in Finland called My Data. How many of you know My Data? It's about reclaiming your personal data through things like GDPR, but through things like asking big networks, big social networks, big tech networks to make possible the ability to export or control who sees your data when and why. This idea of global digital transactions are secure, becoming more and more important. This is also where the blockchain often comes in and cryptocurrency. I heard you should buy Dogecoin now. <laughs> so no, and I think that kind of killed the Web3 moment in some ways was it was driven almost entirely by speculation financially. And that's gonna obviously affect an, a group of educators' impression of Web3, and it should. But I think if we think of this last piece as important, I think there's something for us to think about as we move forward with some of our infrastructure for what we're doing. This idea of online exchanges of information and value being decentralized. And this actually is a big point, because when we heard from um, Colorado yesterday, and they had this amazing program, they were getting millions of dollars for these open educational resources that would be created by a vast community across the state. One of the big questions, I think, is where does it live? How do we gain access? How do we ensure ongoing access? The whole open infrastructure part of our discussions of open is often an afterthought and often offloaded to creepy companies like Reclaim on <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> open web protocols. I talked about RSS. RSS was the big one. That was the open web protocol that made the Blogosphere's Federation possible. There's a new kid in town. <laughs> There's a new kid in town. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I lost my voice last <laughs> So, don't blame me. <laughs> I'm on a way to hell. That was awesome. Well, anyway, I talked about it before you came in. If you had a watch, I'm going to buy you a watch. Oh, oh snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> um, activity pub is in many ways the um, open source protocol that's driving open applications like Mastodon. And that's why I'm interested in Mastodon. And that's why people like John Udell, Dave Weiner, and early web pioneers, maybe they're just like me and they're trying to re relive their glory days. Fair enough, you might want to run the other way. But these people on there who I've watched for decades talking about this as another instance is super interesting and exciting to me. But I'm also afraid that maybe we're gonna relive the same path. We went down with Web 2.0, and I'm not, having been through this rodeo once before, I know how quick and easy that is to go. But here I am on Mastodon, reading Sheila McNeil, talking about Catherine Cronin. I see the tag. This is my own instance of Mastodon. 
I'm running it, yet I can integrate with a vast community of people out there, and I'm not at the behest and bequest of a platform like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. And that still means a lot to me, right? That still means a lot to me that I can own and control my space online. I still believe in it. Now I'm going to end here. And this is a recent post by John Udell, who's basically been doing this presentation for me, all the heavy lifting. Thank you, John. It was a long night last night. I blame Tom. You did a good job. He wrote a post recently called, of course, the attention economy is threatened by the Fediverse. And, you know, Eamon did a good job of talking about chat GBT, as Dave did this morning, like, you know, Mastodon had a moment and then OpenAI came and ChatGPT came and then everything was like, that's it. And you could see the whole ed tech sphere go like, squirrel, <laughs> right? Everybody was there. It's like, you know, there's no social network. And that's fine. I mean, that's part of what our job is to figure that out and to play with it. I'm not against it. I just find it all weird. So I'm kind of staying away from it for now. But he has this blog post, which I highly recommend you read. It's called, of course, the attention economy is threatened by the Fediverse. But what I liked about it is this quote. And you're not supposed to read quotes. That's good, but I will. If you occupy a privileged position in the attention economy, as Megan McArdle does now, and as I once did in a more limited way, then no, you won't see Mastodon as a viable replacement for Twitter. If I were still a quasi-famous columnist, this is what I love about John Udell, I probably wouldn't either. But I'm no longer employed in the attention economy. I just want to hang out online with people whose words and pictures and ideas intrigue and inspire and delight me, and who might feel similarly about my words and pictures and ideas. There are thousands of such people in the world, not millions. We want to congregate in different online spaces for different reasons. Now we can, and I couldn't be happier. When people say it can't work, consider why and who benefits from it not working. And I think that's a really <laughs> nice place to kind of end on this. I don't pretend to be an expert of Web3. I'm starting to experiment with the technologies. We're running some of that stuff on our own cloud to see what's possible. It is exciting that unlike early blogs, this stuff can not only be possible, but scale in ways that never could on a Bluehost account, which I'm excited about. But I'm also excited because of this idea that John represents here is OER23, and I started this presentation intentionally talking about the mood, the space, the people, my excitement, because that's why I got into this space. That's why I got into the social web. That's why I believed in writing and publishing and sharing as a conversation and as participation, not as me being a brand. I'm not interested in that. That doesn't get me excited. And so I'm getting somewhat excited about what's possible in the next step is this idea of hope punk that I'm gonna get it wrong. She said act depressed when you say her name, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's reggae. Say it? Reggae. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying. But as she said, hope punk for life, right? Maybe there is some hope in reclaiming these spaces and rethinking about what it means to federate and to kind of, I don't know, truly believe that we can own some of our space online and that we can get out of the centralized networks that have kind of in some ways defined us as brands, whether we like it or not. And with that, I'm gonna stop. Hopefully I've used, yeah, 20 minutes, perfect. Any questions? I thought that was great too, thank you. <laughs> I've got many, many stuff in sure. my head. <laughs> um, I mean, the federation thing makes me think of Dave's talk earlier about abundance again. There's a, there's a, when you showed the assignment bank and all the assignments there, there's a navigating abundance task that yeah. comes with federation, which is interesting. You know, how do we stop this stuff? If, if Web 3.0 has characteristics of Web 2.0, how do we stop the dystopian cycle from repeating itself? Yeah. And that led me to, to a small experience that you mentioned running your own um, instance of Mastodon and you were kind enough to share that instance with a few of us yeah. and somebody posted not on our instance but it's the blessings and curses of federation somebody posted something racist um, on that and yeah. I hit the report this and I got an email back from you going I've sorted it out and you've got moderation rights yeah. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> <Thank you for laughs> <that. laughs> but that 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 was a moment when like 
you know, the Wizard of Oz metaphor, the, the curtain was drawn back and you suddenly saw in running a Mastodon instance, the ghost work of moderation that sits behind mm -hmm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be a part of that Mastodon instance, yeah. you have to take a share of that work as well as, so there's, there's community building work you have to do in these yeah. spaces as well as just hanging out with your people, yeah. which is how it should be. Yeah. Um, so I think there is something in the way some of these new federated tools work that is building off of where we've been with Web 2.0 and the kinds of kinds of labor that have come in uh, in the background with Twitter and Facebook, that there is this moderation labor that comes with abundance and, and comes with these big centralized networks that, that Web 3.0 is now starting to expose in that federated model. Yeah. And that for me is maybe the place and the space where we can stop the dystopian cycle repeating because it's more than just having fun and hanging out with friends you need to take responsibility for it now as well yeah really think about i it. love that actually no and that's one of the things we had that experience together is like it was a new world to not only figure out how federation works with these social networks but mm -hmm. then it opened you up to questions of how do you understand what's real like what is the url like the url training around where is this coming from but then how you now have to employ a community to control what can happen to any network. But I think maybe that's the difference between Mastodon and um, Twitter is that you have that ability. And like, mm -hmm. luckily I can, I'm talking, this is another DS106 meme made by the great I'm Like So Blonde from that club, uh, course in 2011. But like we had, I created a DS106 instance of Mastodon, not only to play with the technology and see how it works, but also to provide, as Alan Levine was asking for, a space for people who wanted a community outside of other spaces. And luckily, DS106, as small and modest as it is, did provide that. And people like you and other people who I know were willing to jump in, right? Like Darcy Norman, who started being a, a moderator right away. And it was just like, that's great. And it's not crazy. And I trust everybody, but like, isn't that interesting? Like, it's almost like we've taken the community from who are the 5,000 people I'm talking to, to who are the 30 people who I kind of know pretty well and who I know I'll get some share. I can still access the other thousands and millions or whatever, but that community is really localized. And it's localized in some ways, like the keynote yesterday talked about, right? Localizing open online ed. Like the idea of like that people don't have to leave the islands to do that education, yet they still have access to the best elements of the web. I mean, there's something really powerful about the way they federated that program. And I think federation almost as a metaphor might be even more interesting than as a protocol, although both are super interesting. Can I cut you off? <laughs> I'm so I'm so thank you. That's right, exactly. <laughs> I still can't believe I missed the karaoke last night. It's, only, it's all on Twitter. But you haven't moved. <laughs> um, all night was in my bar. All looked like it. <laughs> um, right, so my name is Dean Whitcomb. I, I work at the University of South Wales. I've actually worked at the institution for, for just over 20 years, actually. Um, Used to be the University of Glamorgan, we merged with uh, another university in South Wales, we became the University of South Wales. Um, Eloise, Richard and Charles are my colleagues. Um, we're a very small team. Um, they're currently either on leave or running simulations this week with staff across the organisation. Um, first question, has anyone come across Hydra Immersive Learning? At all? Okay, this is the point where we normally talk about Hydra and Marvel and then we go into all that kind of stuff. Um, and yes, we have delivered Hydra scenarios in the past fully geared in um, Marvel memorabilia. So, uh, yeah, but I, I can get onto that later on. Um, so, my background, uh, my hobbies, I, I love, I'm a cyclist, I love video games, video game modding, I love modifying video games, I love coffee. Uh, I try not to drink too much on days like today, otherwise that 20 minute presentation becomes a five minute presentation. <laughs> um, so I'm really trying to keep my cool here. So um, for many, many years, I, was, I followed a very traditional academic path. I was told to do well in my degree, get a PhD, do the normal thing, become an academic. 
Um, and I really enjoyed my time doing that. Um, and then I took a role, which was in many people's eyes, an interim role within the university. It was a role, it was the actual first technical demonstrator role in the university. And uh, it was a very practical based role, um, kind of bridged the gap between frontline teaching and laboratory based work. Um, so you did, did a bit of both there, ultimately, bridging, bridging that gap. Um, but when I applied for that role, uh, there was 5% of the role, one day every two weeks, dedicated to something called Hydra. And I, I genuinely had no idea what it was in the university, even though I'd worked there for years and years and years. Um, even the people I spoke to before the interview didn't really know what it was in the university. Um, ultimately, I, I went into work on my first day, I, I met with my former colleagues in sport and health, and I then made my way, my way down the campus to the Hydra suite. And then I found a series of rooms, um, pod rooms, control room, and a plenary room, all in darkness, all interconnected in some way, but nobody in the four years of it being installed turned on, so nobody really knew what it was. Um, and, and all I knew was that it was actually installed for police service training. That was the, that was the idea. So there was an agreement with a local police service, and they created this immersive learning environment for training. Um, that was in 2007, I joined in 2011, it was never switched on. So I spent some time turning the lights on, pressing some buttons, <laughs> playing out what things did. Um, and actually at that time there was zero hours of simulated activity in the organisation. And again, I was truly only dedicating one day every two weeks to this area. Fast forward 12 years, and we now have um, two state-of-the-art Hydra in the Cloud suites. Um, and within these normal suite, within a normal, relatively normal suite, we have a plethora of technologies which um, the university provides ultimately. Uh, and what we find is that the immersive nature of what we provide for our students is very different to what would be performed within a police training environment, for example. So a lot of police forces services wouldn't have access to a lot of these other applications um, in these areas. But as of this year, we now conduct more than 2,000 hours of simulated activity across the organisation. I'll give you some more context in a second. Um, this is Professor Jonathan Prego, uh, and Jonathan is the reason why we have the Hydra software, a Hydra license within the organisation. Um, and, and he would be, I, I guess, regarded as an international expert in critical incident decision making. Um, the system was originally installed at the London Metropolitan Police Service following the, uh, the tragic events of the Hillsborough disaster and the Stephen Lawrence murder. Um, and Jonathan was simply asked to help create an immersive learning environment where high-ranking officers could deal with real-life situations, but not be afraid to make mistakes, not be penalised for their mistakes, encouraging that, that safe learning environment. Um, and for many years, the majority of suites across the UK existed within police um, head headquarters. Um, and only at this time in the UK, there are only six universities with this technology. We're still the only one in Wales. Um, and this, essentially, Jonathan's remit is, or his ethos, is that any Save Life organisation is welcome to utilise the hydro technologies that he provides. The wonderful thing is, if you don't pay for hydro, it's actually what I say. We paid one pound for a license every year back in 2011. Um, so this technology is available to universities, um, Safe Life organisations across the UK, and it is still not for profit. As a university, we are not able to sell Hydra. So before I applied for this conference, I, in, in the 20 years of being in HE, I never really thought about um, open education really, but I suppose it's through my openness and willingness to help academics on their journey, creating these experiences for, for, for their students, um, that has actually got us 12 years down the line and in this situation. But actually, it all started with that original visit to the Hendon Police College in London. Um, talking about Marvel and Hydra, this is the building where the Hydra team were housed, and it actually looked very kind of Hydra-esque. Really. Um, <laughs> But, but I remember, I, I knew nothing about Hydra. I walked into this building, I met a team of people, and they introduced themselves, they told us, told me what they did and, and what experiences they had. Uh, I spent three days on site um, with them, and I actually left with a USB stick, 
with nine months worth of simulated immersive learning material for frontline police officers used in that organization. No cost. I just walked back to the university and I had this USB stick. So of course, all the people I was working with at the time were delighted that all of a sudden I brought to them nine months worth of training material for policing. Um, so I spent two years introducing a lot of this content into uh, the programs at the university. And it worked really, really well. What really helped with the integration was that a lot of these people were senior police officers, retired as senior police officers, and had actually designed and ran very high level hydro incidents in their respective forces. Um, but following that period, uh, in my kind of openness, I suppose, I, I decided to just branch out and actually speak to other people who may be interested in such an environment. So I never forget, I, I walked down the one corridor the one day and I saw social work on one of the doors, knocked on the door. I met a, a woman called uh, Judith Fowler. And I said, look, we've got this immersive learning suite and I understand social workers use it in, in and around you know, across the country. Would you be willing to have a look at it and see what you think? Um, so that happened and Judith came along, we created something for the first time with social work students. Um, but also, this was probably the steepest learning curve for me in all the years I've worked within the HG sector. Health and, social, health and Social Care came to me and said as a group, we would love to create an immersive experience for our students, which truly shows what it's like to deal with a vulnerable person at home. So this is, um, <laughs> this is Graham. This is my wife's, Zoe's um, grandfather, and Graham kindly um, volunteered. Um, I had to take him horse racing for the day after that, but uh, <laughs> he always says he kindly volunteered. Um, but Graham, in this particular scenario, his name is Bill, and Bill had a big gash on his leg. He had to have dressing. He was being looked after by health visitors. But, I, but it was the first time where I realized there was a kind of false environment, really, around how much work goes into these immersive simulations. When I left with a USB stick, I truly <laughs> didn't realize how, how difficult it was to create these things. So right there and then, not only was I writing scripts, but I was also learning how to use a camera for the first time, editing media footage, writing storyboards, chain of events <coughs> um, within this particular scenario. And then of course, there was the delivery after that. But actually, that still runs today. Uh, as the same exercise it needs to be slightly updated um, and we do that periodically anyway but that's that core material of gray mac and as that patient um, is still running today i'm very proud of that so in 2015 we had two state-of-the-art suites installed um, and now i work with a small team of people um, i suppose <coughs> you would define our team as a my career i guess has been different to theirs and they would be regarded as hydro technologists um, I'm not sure what I am really after 20 years. Um, I, I, I like that to be honest. You're amongst friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here we are, and we're all this. If I come out, I'll take that. <laughs> um, but if I was to summarize what we do, um, bear in mind that in 2011 we did nothing. I have now worked with some wonderful people, some wonderful subject areas across the organization. And the majority of what we do are hydro simulations, and I can discuss that with you in a second. Um, but I've also used the learning environment to do all this other stuff. Um, and, and it's this is where I normally go off piece and I start talking about all this other stuff that we do. Um, but there's things I'm really proud of, for example, our outreach activities. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that one only. Um, when I first started in policing, we used to bring colleges, local and partner colleges onto campus. We used to talk at them, tell them what police sciences was like, what it's like to be a real police officer. Uh, and some of the feedback I had in the early days was um, our students want something more interactive. We want to do something with you rather than just turning the lights on and talking access. What can we do with you? So my first ever kind of real project that I created that was purely mine uh, was a major incident exercise in line with public services curricula at <coughs> colleges. Um, and since then, I think we now run 45 to 50 visits per year where we get lots of colleges coming in. Um, doing that exercise with us. And we can still kind of sell the course, sell who we are and what we do, but fundamentally they learn when they're with us and we teach with them. Um, and I, and I, I get so much satisfaction, even now after all these years of doing that type of work. Um, but actually all of this activity of the past 10 years has generated lots of outputs, sometimes very sporadic in nature, um, but ultimately <coughs> our students and our staff have always 
wanted to do more. Um, we've never lost anyone. So whenever we've run an exercise, we've always had those people return the following year. The only thing that's stopping us from on this kind of growth curve at the moment is the capacity issue that we have with the organization, but that is being solved slowly but surely, uh, which I'll discuss in a second. But that's kind of what we do. 90% of what we do would be regarded as hydra simulations. So what does that look like? At the start of a hydra day, you would come onto campus and you would sit in a plenary room. And this is where we would give you some context. We brief you on who you are in the exercise, what your role will be for the day. We'd also show how to use the hydra related technologies in the pod rooms. So when students go into these rooms, we don't physically interact with them. Once they're in there, that's their own micro world. That's where they work. When students leave this room for the first time, they go into their pod rooms. We have eight of these in the corridor. I will then sit with the subject matter experts and we will ultimately run the exercise, the scenario from the control room. From the control room, we can observe listening to the conversations. We can also see what type of information the students are accessing at any given time. Now, how seamless is this operation? That's John Manders. John would say to me, Dean, can you send video four into pod rooms one, two, and three? One click on my virtual storyboard, which you can see just there, will then send that information out to all of those pod rooms. Okay. Dungeons and Dragons, the, the books. Yeah, it's kind of like that. The, the most complex exercises that we've run are very much like that. Um, however, however, a lot of the stuff that we do do is very linear. Okay, so a lot of the time we'll send a bulk of information into the pod rooms. Students will solve the problem as a group. And in solving that problem, what they tend to do most of the time is they log their decisions and rationales in relation to that problem that we've set them. So constantly they're making decisions as groups and logging that information electronically in their decision logs. When they're logging that information, subject matter experts, people like myself, we can monitor that information live. So we know as they're progressing through an exercise, what they're deciding to do and why they're doing it. That information is then stored on our central Hydra machine. And then periodically we take students from the pod rooms back to the plenary room where all of their decision logs will be openly displayed for them to discuss. Okay. Um, in essence, that's kind of what happens in a normal day. Our exercises vary considerably. Some run for four hours, half a day. Some exercises run for a full two weeks. Okay. I'm going to use one example of, I, I suppose, openness and sharing is, is primarily what I love to do. Um, and I'm going to give you this one example of how um, I, I refer to it as exercise-induced collaboration, a product which brings people into the environment. Um, this is an exercise that we created um, during peak COVID. Um, this is Ian Davis. Um, and as you find out in a second, Ian Davis um, is not very good at using social media. Um, he's lost a lot of jobs uh, across policing, nursing, health and social care, social work. He's appeared in lots of different scenarios. <laughs> Um, but this was wonderful, peak COVID really. We were the first, or one of the first groups in the university to bring students back to campus. And we actually modified all of our classrooms to become pod rooms. So these pod room spaces, which were no bigger than this per pod, we actually had to have full classrooms kitted out two meters apart, and we could actually run our scenarios um, in the classroom environment. Um, but we used Microsoft Teams, it was a, re a real kind of I, I, I want to say hybrid, but after yesterday's presentation, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've actually removed the term from some of the slides. But uh, yeah, so we, we had this hybrid model running um, with, with Teams and Hydra technologies running, uh, and it was okay. Ultimately, post COVID, we've had lots of feedback. Students and staff want the whites of the eyes, they want to be physically on campus doing these types of things. Here's an example of one exercise and how open we are with this type of material. That exercise was designed at level four policing uh, for a policing course. We store all of our raw materials in Hydra, all of the exercises that we do in a OneDrive folder and in Hydra in the cloud. In the OneDrive folder and the Hydra exercises, we have all of the subject areas that we work with. You click on that, the exercise loads up in a separate folder. That folder is then shared with the subject matter expert, the person who designed the exercise with originally. However, lots of the content is shared with any staff member who has any interest in that type of content. So we designed two versions of that exercise. All of a sudden, uh, as part of this Hydra, this Hydra-wide family, 
when police asked us if we could simply transfer that material for their investigation training um, that particular year. So this, this went back last year. Fine, we sent those materials over. It was used for promotional training. Since then, other forces using the Hydra technologies have simply requested the content and the exercise. One click their end on the Hydra system notifies us that someone wants that content. We simply click yes. That content is now shared between the organisations. And what you hope is that you have this reciprocal relationship where we provide something, they modify something, send it back, we all get to share a different exercise. That same exercise has been used for induction activities and undergraduate teaching across the organisation. Slightly different, i.e. we change the profession, some of the tweets or some of the chirps that we create as part of the exercise. Um, we, those chirps are created, I guess, on real life evidence, real life problems. Um, and to date, um, I think that number's correct. Um, it's definitely more than 2,000 students have experienced that kind of exercise in our hydro simulation environments. The future for us, pretty straightforward. Lots of demand, we're growing every year. Um, hydro will feature physically on all of our campuses in the next three years, uh, but we're also networking a lot of our simulation spaces. Um, so you've got this kind of neural network, I suppose, being created between the simulation spaces across the university. This is the next big thing uh, for us in particular, again, going back to that term hybrid. This is the team's version of Hydra, essentially. So you're not required to be physically on campus or present. You can use, this has been developed right now, we're going to be the first university to use it. Um, but this is essentially, you can be anywhere in the world, any device, you'll be able to engage in some kind of physical Hydra exercise. Now, Keith mentioned UHI yesterday. I, I didn't realize that that's UHI. I, I had no idea. And I thought straight away, well, actually, wouldn't Hydra presence be wonderful to have that type of Teams-like platform running amongst all of your organizations? The wonderful thing is, um, there is one suite already in Scotland, and it actually belongs to, I don't know how you pronounce that. Tally Allen. Tally Allen. OK, so I've been told that's an, an amazing suite, and it's full of oak beams, and it's stunning. But I've not been invited up there yet. <laughs> I'm not bitter about it at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but actually, it's a fantastic suite, and, and I think typically what's going to happen with this type of software is that it's only going to be given to Hydra suites which already exist physically. So actually, who knows in the future, why not approach an organisation like that to potentially help you run these types of exercises? Something I learned yesterday as well, I didn't know about this. Um, so just here in Inverness, there's nursing education, BSEs in, in, in nursing. Our biggest users of the street right now and growth over the last two years has been health and nursing related courses. If UHI become hydroactive tomorrow, they would have access to all of this content. It's taken us, the organization, hundreds and hundreds of hours, tens of thousands of pounds in terms of cost to create. That would be openly accessible for that organization to use. And that's how I, I suppose we've always worked really across not only the university, but across um, other organizations as well. How much time do I have? Um, about eight minutes. Lovely. Okay. Um, every presentation I've done in the last five years, there's never enough time for questions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip all this. Personally, there's something I'm working on right now, which is um, a simulation framework for the university. What we do is wonderful. We've been acknowledged in many ways, but in some ways, extremely inefficient as well. And my plan is to help the university do something about that long term, I suppose. Uh, we will continue growing. People will always see the, the uniqueness of the environment. Students will always enjoy it. Um, but whether we're truly generating the best simulated experiences, which truly replicate the complexities of the real world, I'm not really sure. Um, but we need to start somewhere, and this is what I'm currently working on right now. Um, if you have any questions around today, um, and one bit of advice really would be if you work anywhere near a Hydra so you can go to this website and check where these, these sites exist. And I've met some of the most wonderful collaborative people um, through Hydra, and I'm sure you'll be more than welcome to discuss any ideas that you have potentially for your own organisation. And just one disclaimer, I don't work for the Hydra Foundation. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you. We have about six minutes for questions. That gets us to 12.50, but then, of course, if you want to continue chatting to me, I'm sure she's open to that. And I will definitely make a note for our nurses, because I've worked with them, and this sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but any questions? We can have that. Um, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, so do you have sort of almost like a, a pattern, a sets of patterns for developing these sim simulations that you share? Because I think that would be, even just sharing those patterns more widely Absolutely. and then lessons and that would be really, really useful. Uh, going, going back to that, that framework very quickly, one of, the, one, of the, one of the big things I've worked on is actually explain or trying to create some guidance for senior managers across the organisation, showing sometimes how complex these exercises mm -hmm. can be and, and how much time is spent um, not just by the academic, but by us and media teams and people that we bring in to create these scenarios. Um, we have a, a kind of standard design model. For the, a couple of years ago, for the first time ever, I was asked to create some kind of like workload for what we do, um, and, and that was very foreign to me. I've never really worked with, um, I've never really worked with a workload before. Um, so all I could do really was go back over all of the exercises that we created to date, and you have those exercises which, yes, they run for four hours and. It may have taken two or three days worth of development time. But then you have an exercise that runs for two weeks, and that took six months to develop. And that exercise in particular required the buy-in of an external police organisation, consent from the family, whose um, daughter sadly was, was murdered uh, many years ago, um, and trying to recreate those real-life um, things really it just takes time even like freedom of information requests yeah. for example just took so much time um but, but try to articulate that um especially when workloads are what they are and, and every hour is accounted for and every development hour is accounted for it's trying to break that, that kind of mold really and trying to get people to see how complex these things can be really yeah. um, a, a common question always is how long do these things take and, yeah yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely I have a question. Um, I did something on simulation-based education last year, and uh, we were looking at how we can combine actually cross, uh, kind of, um, and encourage cross collaboration between different disciplines. So nursing, business, um, and various other courses. So um, I'm just wondering if there is currently any content within this uh, Hydra system which can be used in business management courses to. Uh, teach negotiation skills or um, uh, perhaps some other key soft skills that are quite important for business management students? Okay, so um, our, most, our most impactful uh, peer review publication came from business, would you believe? Um, and it was a, a simulation assessment, um, which I can talk to you about outside the like feedback. Um, with negotiation, um, I suppose. Hostage negotiation, so to mind straight away because I can think of all the stuff that one thing one thing I didn't show you actually was the cloud system itself. When I log on to Hydra, I get to see all of the other organizations across the world who are online, and I'm able to simply browse all of their content at any given time. So for example, the stuff that you're looking for, you might find that UPlan has an exercise specifically designed for negotiation. Now, if you're part of that Hydra family, it's a simple case of requesting and asking for that information. Um, lots of exercises, like major incidents, for example, in the real world, they're solved by multiple agencies. So straight away within HE, we've got multiple subject areas that should be working together. Um, so when we, and that's what I talked about earlier, exercise-induced collaboration. Very often we sell these exercises which have multiple buy-ins from multiple subject areas and, and um, academics. So is there a question? Yeah, that was fascinating. Um, I was trying to understand, I suppose, obviously you're in an academic environment and you quoted Professor Prego in that environment, but it sounds like um, it was widely used outside that environment, or in a sense there's two different perhaps products or versions of um, maybe they're not that different. No, it's, uh, it's, I, I suppose it was born in policing, the actual environment fundamentally. Um, it, for example, if you look at our suite and you look to compare that with the London Metropolitan Police Service, technologically, the Hydra suites are built the same. But the practice which is conducted in them are very, very different. One example, sort off the top of my head, um, in Hydra, in a police service, you might create a, an incident, let's say a stabbing incident, and, and, and officers are turning up to a scene to deal with this incident. 
for, the, for police officers who are currently in the role or, or SIOs or senior investigators, um, they'll simply be left with that information. What are you going to do next? There is no task, there is no direction. With level three, level four, level five, level six students, we're very prescriptive sometimes in the way in which we want the students to work in that they don't have that operational, that real life experience. So even though the exercise content could be the same between HE and a police service, the way in which we design it and actually facilitate the information may be very different. Um, but the, the actual types of activities that we do, for example, the pod rooms, we, we, can, we conduct escape rooms and induction periods for students. That's probably not done in any other high street across the UK, but that's where we've used the learning environment to create these wonderful experiences, really. Um, yeah. Okay, and with that, go one minute until 12.50, so maybe we'll just break for lunch. Please help me give another round of applause to you. And then we'll reconvene at two. Enjoy the lunch. Thank you. That was really nice.